now on CHM Revolutionaries. Clearly there's a customer market fit there and there's a product market fit there. How do we then fan that? How do we grow that? How do we create even more connections? When a founder's vision sparks a funder's interest, an idea can become a company that reimagines community. That's what happened when TaskRabbit founder Leah Busk and Floodgate venture capitalist Anne Mira Co. joined forces. Busk and Mira Co. joined CHM's Marguerite Gong Hancock to discuss their partnership growing one of the earliest companies of the sharing economy. So we um, would love to start with your background and what it was in your early years that kind of led or said that um, led sowed the seeds of you getting involved with tech and entrepreneurship. Let's start with you, Anne. Yeah, um, so I grew up actually right here in Silicon Valley. Um, I was in fifth grade, I moved to Palo Alto. Before that, I was in Fremont, California. My dad uh, worked over at NASA Ames Research Center. Um, for over 30 years, um, and you know, when I was babysitting in fifth grade, the, the guy I was babysitting for was a serial entrepreneur. Um, and in high school at Pally High, I was uh, going over to uh, a student's house to teach her how to debate. I was on the, the captain of the debate team, and it turned out it was um, Steve Jobs' daughter. So I, I ran into Steve Jobs at the house, I was like, why are you here? And I'm like, <laughs> like oh, it's your house. Um, so it was sort of steeped in, in that kind of um, entrepreneurship technology. Um, and I think the, the seminal moment for me was I, I always knew I was going to be in STEM. So when I got to college, I majored in electrical engineering. But initially, I thought it was going to be a doctor. Um, I realized that I wasn't nearly empathetic enough, and I didn't like sick people. And so um, I, I decided I had to find another calling. And it was at that moment, actually, um, I had been working in, as part of the work study at Yale, you have, to, you have to work, I think it was like 10 hours a week or something. Um, and I, I chose to work in the, the office of the dean of engineering. The, the other choice was actually refilling formaldehyde in uh, biology labs. So that was the easy choice. Easy choice. choice. Right. Yeah. I chose right. Yeah. And then, uh, and in one of those, in, uh, as I was working in this office, um, I was asked to give the tour of the engineering department to a guest. And I didn't know who it was, but I was giving this tour to this guest. And he started talking to me. He said, well, you know, where do you live? I said, I live in Palo Alto. He said, are you going back home for spring break? I said, in fact, I am. And um, he said, well, how would you like to see what I do for a living? And you know, I was totally naive. I turned to him and I said, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I'm the CEO of Hewlett Packard. <laughs> um, this is Lou Platt. And I, I remember just thinking to myself, this is so weird. But yes, I'd love to come see what you do for a living. Um, what was incredible was it was two weeks completely changed my life because I wasn't interested in business at the time. And he opened my eyes to this world of business, just like an incredible gentleman uh, CEO, just uh, of the long lineage of Hewlett Packard. Um, and at the end, I get back to my dorm. And in that week, they, they had had um, a dot .NET announcement with Bill Gates. And so Bill Gates had come in. And I never got to interact with Bill Gates. But at one point, Lou had asked me to come into his office. And there were photographers. So he's like, sit here, and we'll take your picture. Um, and when I got back to my dorm, he had sent me two pictures. He said, thank you so much for coming to visit. I thought you would enjoy these two pictures. And one was I'm sitting in this, on this couch talking to Lou Platt. And the second picture was Bill Gates had actually sat exactly <laughs> in that same spot <laughs> talking to Lou Platt that same day. And it was like this first moment where, I mean, he didn't say it, but I was like, I can be, I can be Bill Gates. It's like, that's what I'm meant to be. And this was when he was on top of the world. And I remember I told my parents this. And they were like, 
why don't you go work for Hewlett Packard? Um, and I, I remember just thinking, well, like there's so much out there in the world that I don't know. And it sparked this curiosity for me, which I think um, was really inspirational. It's still, it still inspires me to think about what mentorship is. It's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing that. How about you, Leah? Where does your story begin on the other side of the coast, uh, the other part of the country? It does. Yeah, my story begins on the East Coast. I grew up in the Boston area about an hour outside of the city in a tiny town called Shirley, Massachusetts, population 4,000. Um, <laughs> there was no stoplight in town. Uh, K through 8 was in one building. It was just really, really tiny, really rural. My father was in the Air Force, he was a civilian, um, and he worked at Hanscom Air Force Base where he worked for over 30 years. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, really no exposure at all to entrepreneurship or computers or anything like that. Um, but in high school, um, I started dating this young man, who's now my husband, um, who was really into computers. And we would spend Friday nights building computers. We would spend the weekends going to um, computer um, flea markets and buying motherboards and connecting systems. And um, that was what we did for fun in high school. Um, so I was a computer nerd, um, but only because the guy I was sort of dating, you know, was into it. And, um, I was also really into the arts and the creative side and ballet. And so when I went to college, I thought, I'm going to go find a school where I can major in dance. Like, it wasn't even in my realm to focus on math or computer science. Math was always something that I loved. I just, my general nature was I loved STEM, I loved math. Um, and so when I got to college, Sweetbriar College, a small women's college in Virginia, to major in dance, um, I started taking math courses. And I decided, oh, I think I'll major in math and you know, major in dance as well. And then as part of the requirements, I had to take C++ programming. And as soon as I realized that there was a platform where I could take all of these ideas and all these creative things that were bouncing around in my head and actually code them and build them and not rely on anyone else to do that for me, that for me was the, what clicked. And so I kind of swapped everything. I ended up majoring in math and computer science and I did this little dance minor on the side because it was fun. Um, and after college, I was able to get a job as a programmer. And so I started at a small company called Iris Associates, which was Ray Ozzie's company, who went on to found Groove and work at Microsoft. And um, we were the original developers of Lotus Notes and Domino. That's great. And so um, that was an incredible experience, because I got to step into a legacy code base that had been around um, you know, for a decade or, or more at that point. Um, and really go deep and really learn about a full technology stack. And at the time, you know, we were still burning CDs and packaging software and shipping them around the globe. And so what else it taught me was a lot about code integrity mm -hmm. and how to ensure that code that I wrote that day and checked into the platform that day would not only build in the release room that morning, but a customer wouldn't touch what I did for 18 months. And so it had to be right. It had to be good. Um, and, I, and I loved that about programming. And so I ended up spending eight years at IBM. IBM bought Lotus, and we all got merged into IBM. And this was in the Boston office in Cambridge. And um, you know, to be honest, about five years in, I started to get antsy. I started to feel like I love technology. I love programming. I love building software that millions of people are using around the globe every day. But I also feel like I have all the other skills that I'm not really using on a daily basis. And so in February of 2008 um, is when I had the idea for TaskRabbit. And I ended up quitting my job at IBM four months later to build the first version of that site. This is a special relationship between uh, these two people because there are many investors that invest in a lot of entrepreneurs. And there are entrepreneurs that have a lot of different investors. But it happens to be that this pair was the ones that took their bet on each other first. What I mean by that is 
that Anne was a new VC, uh, and of all the deals that she was looking at, the first entrepreneur that she chose to invest in was Leah. And Leah had, had some angel investing and some others, but the first institutional venture capital came from Anne. When did you decide to make it a company? Tell us that. So uh, my husband and I, Kevin, um, were living in Boston at the time. And it was February of 2008. I remember it was February because it was cold and snowing outside. And my husband and I were getting ready to go out to dinner when we realized we were out of dog food. And we always had these really geeky conversations in the house. And that night, the conversation turned into, wouldn't it be nice if there was just a place online we could go, say we needed dog food, name the price we're willing to pay. We were certain that there was someone in our own neighborhood that would be willing to help us out, maybe even someone at the store at that very second, and it was just a matter of connecting with them. Sounds very simple today, but 10 years ago, um, this was not a concept that was prevalent. Um, you know, no one was jumping in strangers' cars to share rides. You would be <laughs> insane to do that in 2008. Um, or sleep in strangers' homes. Stranger, invite someone into your home. Yeah. That would be crazy. There was no app store. The iPhone had come out four months earlier. Facebook was just breaking out of the college scene. It was really early days. But for me, as an engineer, I got really passionate about these emerging technologies, social, location, and mobile. And I realized that I could combine them to connect real people in the real world to get real things done. And then it became in real time. And so four months later, I quit my job at IBM. I built the first version of the site, got it launched in Boston. And then a really incredible mentor who we both know, Scott Griffith, who at the time was the CEO of Zipcar, um, he was letting me work out of his office. He mentioned this program um, that Facebook was running in the summer of 2009 called FB Fund. And it was an incubator program. And he thought, hey, you're building on the Facebook platform. You're one of the first companies ever to do that. Why don't you go out to the Bay Area um, and participate in the program and check it out? I got connected to Anne from an advisor, and it's a longer story, but it was Tim Ferriss who ended up connecting us. From the four-hour work week? From, yep, Tim from the four-hour work week. I, I hustled my way into getting him as an advisor into the company, and then he connected me to Anne and said, um, you know, I know you want to raise a seed round of funding. This was at the end of the Facebook Fund Incubator Program. You should meet Anne. And so we met for breakfast. Do you remember kind of the pitch that, that Leah made? What was it that intrigued you as you yeah. were looking at the idea? Sure. What was that process of changing from a PhD student into a venture capitalist? Yeah, so um, after college, actually, I worked for uh, a few years. Um, and one of my jobs was actually as an associate at a venture capital firm, um, Charles River Ventures on the East Coast. But my second day of work was 9-11. And um, I really actually enjoyed working there and sort of seeing um, venture in a real downturn. Um, I thought it was just very interesting. And, and the, the benefit for me was I knew I was going back to grad school. And so I had applied to a PhD program at Stanford and gotten in um, for math modeling and computer security, the operations research department. And partially, I'd done that because I wanted to be a founder. And I knew that I wanted to be a technical founder. And I figured that in security, the, the problems keep coming up. And so the timing of my PhD actually wouldn't matter. Um, and it was in an area of research that uh, I thought was just developing. And I, it turned out I was right. When I arrived at Stanford, um, this area was not an area that had any conferences. Um, I had full funding, and so I could pick my professor. Uh, but I remember uh, there are people in the computer security group that would say, you know, if you have a computer security problem, it's a technology problem. It's not a risk problem. And, and they told me that my research wasn't headed down a good path. Um, I think like, what I learned from that was you can actually be entrepreneurial even in academics. Um, I actually uh, refused to take the qualifying exams that they had designed for most of the PhD students, and I designed my own. <laughs> um, I, I then constructed my own um, reading and dissertation committee. 
um, to basically serve the purpose that I wanted to, to have it serve. Um, and, and I designed it so that I would be able to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, and then in the midst of that, I felt like I was ready to go and start my own company. And one of my advisors said, you know, you've been in academia for four years now, and you need to go out and see what's in the real world. And so his suggestion was that I find an angel investor and just see what their deal flow looked like. And so as I'm constructing this business in my head, I went and asked a bunch of angel investors if I could sit in with them, and Mike Maples was nice enough to say sure. And we would have these meetings, we called them unpartners meetings, because venture capital firms have partners meetings and we were not partners. <laughs> and, um, and we would invite other angels and we'd, we'd invite all these companies to come and pitch for us. And it was at this point that I realized the venture had suddenly changed. And I knew it through the eyes of my students because you know, it was this sudden moment in 2007 really where um, you actually had cloud services really emerging. You had really robust open source software. You had actually commoditized hardware. And um, all of these things were becoming a reality. And so these people, these entrepreneurs, no longer had to raise $5 million and sell 50% of their company. And Mike was pitching 500,000 is the new 5 million. And that really resonated for me. And, and so I could see why people only needed $500,000, maybe a million dollars. And as we're looking at these companies, Mike actually ends up raising a, a small fund. And he had been angel investing for some time, um, but at one point he called me and he said, hey, um, you know, Anne, we've been working together on these unpartner, unpartner meetings for a few months now, but now I've accidentally raised a fund and I, I really want a co-founder. And um, I think I have a great idea. You should drop out of your PhD program. And this isn't a venture-backed startup like you want to do, but now it's a back venture startup. Let's go. Um, and I remember I'm in this car. I'm driving up to Tahoe. And I'm like, this guy's crazy. Like, he wants to start a venture capital firm. And back then, like now, it seems like very natural. Everyone right. does it. But um, Back then, it was unheard of. And I remember going back to my advisors and my mentors, and they would say, why don't you go and be an associate at like an actual real name venture firm, like one that people have heard of, because no one's heard of this Maples Investments. And, um, but I think it's sort of what entrepreneurs like Leah feel, right? It's like you see this opportunity, and now it's 2008, so the crash is happening. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother is freaking out because she's like, as far as I'm concerned, venture capital is a financial institution, and there is a financial crisis happening. Um, and you spent four or five years now on this research, and you're throwing it all away. And so um, in May, I got started with Mike. Um, just immediately fell in love with not only the opportunity that we were pursuing, but also working with this incredible guy who gave me incredible opportunities to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, and seeing that there was truly an opportunity to, to make these investments. But the truth of the matter was I was a PhD candidate. Um, I had like no track record. I, I was sort of flying by the seat of my pants and trying to create a story for why people should take money from me. But I couldn't really construct a great reason why they should take money from me versus these great other investors. Um, and so it was just sort of this hustle. And I remember um, one of my mentors actually said, you know, Anne, you should really finish this PhD too. It's going to give you immense credibility. And so it was a struggle. This time period was from 2009 to 2010 when I was 2008 to 2009, when I was hunting for the, the Leahs of the world, I was also finishing up my PhD by waking up at 4.30 in the morning every day. Um, I had a year and a half old daughter at the time. I then soon became pregnant with my second child, to which my mom was like, you are crazy. <laughs> and, then, um, and then I said I was going to defend my thesis. Um, that's where I defended six week postpartum. Um, and, then, and then I found Leah. And like that to me was, you know, I, I kind of knew she was talking to other people, but I remember I'd spent this year just looking at a bunch of companies. And when you know, you just kind of know. There's, 
this is, no one had talked about sharing economy. And here's this young, vivacious, energetic little woman. <laughs> it's true. And she's like sitting across from me eating breakfast and she is just <laughs> jamming on this idea. And um, I just fell in love, like fell in love hard with this idea, with this woman who's across the table from me. And I remember I emerged from Peninsula Creamery and I was like, I am going to win this investment. And I'm like, Mike is not going to make this investment. This is mine. And then I'm calling all these people. I'm calling Tim Ferriss. And I'm like, do not let her meet with one other person. He's like, I don't know if I can do that. And then I'm like, maybe she should meet with all these people I know. And I was teaching with Steve Blank. So I was like, please, Steve Blank, meet with Leah. Tell her how amazing I am. And then like, I said, Leah should meet with Eric Reese. And then Eric, I was like, Eric, tell her that I'm just like the most amazing investor you've ever met. And all these people just were like super nice about it. And, and they did. Yeah. They would like, yeah. they had no information to go on based on that, but they would say these things for me. Um, but I remember being super paranoid and just wanting it so much um, and chasing Leah down and basically begging her to take my money. And then she fortunately did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear your side of the story. Yeah. Did it feel that way? It's funny pursuit? because I remember the email you sent me. So we had breakfast at the creamery. It was such an engaging conversation. So at that point, I had particularly met with a lot of investors on the East Coast in the Boston area. And then I came out, did the incubator program, and had met a bunch of angels and other investors on the West Coast as well. But when I sat down with Anne, like something clicked, right? Like yeah. that feeling was mutual. She really understood my vision for the business. And we went back and forth. I mean, I remember it was like 90 minutes to two hours. We were yeah. sitting there going back and forth about this company. I hadn't had any other meetings like that. And so I left the meeting feeling like, oh my God, I hope I can get her, you know? And I remember the email she sent me, um, just a few hours later, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a sentence I remember vividly that was like, I haven't stopped thinking about this idea since we laughed. Usually that's a good sign. And I don't know if you know this story, but a few years later, John Zimmer at Lyft forwarded me an email from you that had the same sentence in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to John at that moment, she's in. And he's like, how do you know? And I said, because she wrote that same sentence to me. <laughs> and so that's just kind of a funny aside. But um, it's true. Um, it's my giveaway. Yeah, everybody knows now. <laughs> they get an email for that me. line. <laughs> that <laughs> sentence. So, um, but yeah, I mean, she had connected me with amazing people who vouched for her and were amazing references for her. And so I was really excited about working with Anne, the shared vision there. And you know, she talked a little bit about her technical background. I mean, that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. As a young female technical entrepreneur, to me, a female venture capitalist that was a computer science major too, like that resonated. And of course, like, of course I wanted to work with her, you know? So, um, yeah, it was like two, like, very unusual animals came yes. together. And we're like, I recognize you. At a terrible time. <laughs> I mean, in 2009, this was an awful time to raise money, by the way. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a mix, I think, of a lot of unique circumstances that brought us together. Let's now go to the company started. You have your funding. Now comes time to start execute. Mm -hmm. Start to execute. You're building your team. What were some of the early sort of challenges that you were working on, and how did it work to have Anne as as your investor? And, and I mean, investor? one thing I remember early on. So we we set up a board at that point. We got together every four weeks or so. Anne was so, so, so helpful in the beginning about helping me figure out what to measure, how to measure it, and then how to be really disciplined about what the milestones were. What is the path forward? How do we take this 
seed, scale the company into a series A? What does the company need to look like at that point? How do we back into it? Like, what are the KPIs? And because of her analytical background, you know, she was able to help drive those discussions and really, I think, help create a really solid foundation that then permeated throughout the culture of the company from the beginning. Like, TaskRabbit was always very metrics driven, very fiscally responsible, really focused on unit economics. And yes, I'm an engineer and I love math as well, but that also was driven from Anne in the early days, which was fantastic. So Anne, as you're looking at new company, new founder, this is uncharted territory, as you said, right? This yeah, I mean, economy. I think so first of all, the sharing economy isn't named. Um, it's sort of this idea. And um, first of all, Leah, as you can tell already, is an incredible storyteller. And um, she was trying to figure out how to tell this story, not only to investors and to technologists and, and the engineers she was trying to hire, um, but to, to the regular person who was using the service. And she would come back to these board meetings with incredible stories of people connecting. Mm -hmm. And I think the one that stays with me even to this day is there was um, a, a guy who, a young man who had ended up in the hospital. He, they suddenly discovered he had cancer. Mm -hmm. And his mother wanted him to have some food in the hospital that wasn't hospital food. Mm -hmm. And so she posts this this job on TaskRabbit asking someone to bring her son food at the hospital, and who picks it up but another mother. And I like, I still tear up even thinking about this, but mm -hmm. she, I remember Leah telling the story and she's saying, I think we're redefining a neighborhood. Like this is what people in a neighborhood used to do. Mm -hmm. um, but now you're connecting a woman, I think she was in California, yeah with another mother in Boston mm -hmm. to, to service one another and create an incredible in-person connection. And, um, and I remember just like knowing that that was special and trying to help empower Leah to be able to tell that story and then figure out from that like clearly there's a customer market fit there and there's a product market fit there, how do we then fan that? How do we grow that? How do we create even more connections? I'd like to talk about that, that aspect as you start to grow. You went from Boston to other cities and started to have this challenge of going what, beyond what your original team could do. Talk, talk about your team and then how did that then build into scaling with your customers as well as the other taskers? I knew, I'm very self-aware about what I don't know. I, I, I think I have a pretty good handle about what I'm good at, and then I'm okay and have zero ego about the things I don't know how to do. Bringing people around the table that can fill in those gaps, that have an aligned vision and aligned passion for the mission of what you're building was really important. And that goes the same with investors. Bringing in someone like Anne in the beginning who really had that aligned vision and knew she had seen how to build and scale a venture-backed company. Those were the skill sets that I needed. Um, yeah, team is just incredibly important. And of course, there's a lot of learnings and a lot of misfires and a lot of adjustments you have to make along the way. The people you know, usually that you bring in on day one are not gonna be the same people when you're 50 people, 100 people, 200 people. It just doesn't usually scale that way. And so you have to be um, willing to always do what's best for the business and always you know, take care of people as well and figure out how to balance those two things at all times. So you have talked about sort of BHAGs, these you know, big, hairy, audacious goals. And what was one of the ones that you set out for you at TaskRabbit? And did you make it? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in having big, hairy, audacious goals. And to the point where I, I have a vision of what these audacious goals look like, I feel like if you have a goal in your mind and you're almost afraid to share it with people because it's so embarrassing, it's so fanatical, it's like you want to shove it away in the closet, like that is the type of goal you should have. And so um, as a side note, when I was at IBM, I was, I remember vividly a moment where I was told I was too ambitious. 
And I thought, that's weird. Like, I thought ambition was a good thing. Like, I don't understand. Is this negative feedback, or are we celebrating an ambition? It was very confusing. But I realized at that moment that not everyone um, is ambitious. Not everyone has big, hairy, audacious goals. But I knew that someday, if I started a company, if I did my own thing, I would always inspire my team to think big. And so I remember one brainstorming session. Jamie was there. She's shaking her head. We did post-it notes all over this whiteboard. And we, I was really pushing people, like, think big. What's like the craziest idea you could put up here that's going to make us all laugh hysterically? Like, the goal is to make everyone else in the room think you are insane. And so one of the goals that someone put up, and it was a woman in member services, like, you know, just individual contributor doing really well at the company. She put up, when President Obama posts a task on TaskRabbit, we know we will have made it. And it was like 2010 or 11, probably 2010. And so we all laughed. We thought it was hilarious. We're like, that's great. That would be so funny. Good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Three years later, we're at the White House. We're presenting to President Obama and his team about how the TaskRabbit technology and platform that we built could be used in times of disaster relief, in times of recovery, and connecting volunteers, and uh, providing services in a community that really needs it. And, um, so that was an amazing moment because we, we all recognized that three years earlier, you know, we had put that goal up on the board. Now, President Obama himself did not post the task, just to be clear. Many people on his senior advisory team did. Um, and we always joked, you know, maybe eight years after the presidency, he could make an extra money doing tasks on TaskRabbit. Who knows? <laughs> still have goals. Um, but it was an amazing moment. And we did take the time to recognize that as, wow, we connected the, the dots back. And I think what I realized is have the big, hairy, audacious goals, but also set the baby steps to get there. You have to think in bite-sized pieces as well and really connect the dots. And today, as a founder, the one thing you might need to do is, like, take out the trash, like just something that feels so menial, so nothing, no impact, that's OK. Every day, you have to think about, what can I do in the next 24 hours to push the company forward? And tomorrow, it might be pre presenting to President Obama, right? But on a daily basis, what is it that you can do to move even an inch further and closer to that goal? So Anne, as you're watching and, and uh, working with uh, entrepreneurs and founders that have these audacious goals, how do you really help um, them hack value and create both growing and sustainable value? Yeah, I think, you know, so having been with Floodgate now since 2008, we've seen a lot of different types of companies grow up in this market, and the market has changed drastically. Uh, one of the things that we've noted is that just kind of like the same way that there's fake news, we believe that there's the same thing as fake growth. And too often, our, our entrepreneurs get really caught up in the news cycle of what growth is. And, um, and we're trying to help pull our entrepreneurs back and give them a little bit of time and a little bit of breathing room so that they can have real growth, that the revenue that they're claiming isn't subprime revenue, um, that what they're, what they're able to do is build a sustainable business that's real. And for us, what we found is that there's this period where we say you have to hack value. That means you're going from absolutely nothing, an idea in your head, and now you have to prove the existence of this company, which is you have to prove that you provide value to someone out there, that someone deeply cares about what you're producing. And then from there, that, that singular value, now you have to use the least amount of energy to produce the most amount of revenue that you possibly can. And most of the time, I think, in, even in Silicon Valley, people are are forgetting the, the least amount of energy portion. They're consuming a ton of capital. They're, they're just trying to grow their business at all, all cost. And we're trying to introduce this notion of discipline and what is it that allows your company to grow, go from zero to one, and then one to X. 
And then and only then should you choose a path of blitz scaling with massive amounts of capital or potentially even just growing your business profitably with a small amount of capital. Um, and we found that in working with so many entrepreneurs over 10 years that we've learned a lot of these lessons. We have the scar tissue of fake growth. We have the scar tissue of people not balancing cash burn with the amount of growth that they have. And so what we found is that over time, um, that scar tissue is actually quite valuable. And, um, and we're able to translate that knowledge to some of the people that, that we're working with today. Thank you. Speaking of scar tissue, we've talked so far about a lot of wins and the up and to the right. How about a dark moment? Leah, can you share an example, a yeah. specific story, a, a moment in, in during TaskRabbit time when you were in your dark moment? You know, one of the moments that was really tough is when we made the transition to the new product. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah, I, was I mean, that was a big undertaking. Um, so, quick context. I launched the site in 2008, 2009. I built it as a web platform based off the eBay marketplace model. Um, then the sharing economy comes in in 2010, 2011. Then all of a sudden, on demand and these mobile first apps start up in 2012, 2013. By 2013, 2014, we're realizing like, whoa, I think we might have missed the boat on mobile. And this on demand thing is really complicated, but it's kind of table stakes now for the end user, for the consumer. Like, what are we gonna do about that? And so there were a lot of tough board meetings. There were a lot of tough board discussions. Um, and what we decided to do was take a brand new product, mobile first, launch it in London. Launch it in an international market where no one had ever heard of us before and test it. This was very controversial. Um, you know, some people thought that we were too distracted and we were going to go open a new country with a new product and like, what are we thinking? We're still a small team. I'm so glad we did that in hindsight because the product in London worked great. When we decided to transition it back to the U.S., millions of customers, 50,000 taskers, it was a complete disaster. I mean, it was really, really hard. It took not only just a product and technology overhaul and we kind of ripped out all the tech and we put in this London product, but then we also had to retrain and re-operationalize all of our tasker community and get them up and running. And it, the pricing, the on-demand nature, everything changed overnight. And it was really, really hard. Um, and the NPS, the net promoter score, the satisfaction of both sides of the marketplace, just negative dived. It, it was awful. It was a really scary time. But we, we knew, we knew internally that we had made the right decision because we saw the product work in London and we realized that we just needed to ride out this, um, this, this baggage, this history that we had with this customer base that was used to things working a certain way. And we were going to have to really work through the transition with them, sort of hand in hand, side by side. And so we had our eye on the end goal of continuing with the transition, which meant bringing in new customers and recruiting new taskers. And, you know, Stacy was really helpful at this pivotal moment because she had seen a same sort of pattern happen when the new Gmail interface was launched at Google. Everyone hated it and everyone was up in arms. And so she would get up at our Monday morning stand up with the team and everyone is like really distraught and we're all looking at the numbers and she's like, guys, this is normal. It's gonna be okay. I've seen it happen before. We're gonna come out of this trough. And guess what we did? Um, we came out better and stronger and the team was better and the customer base was better and the revenue was better and growing faster. But it was a really scary time. Um, and I mean, honestly, I think, I'm glad I went into it without actually realizing how much heavy lifting and how much hard work that was going to be. Like, I don't know if I could do that again. It was hard. Um, and I don't know, I'd be curious to hear like your side of that moment from an investor board perspective. Yeah. Um, mm. I, so, so I appreciate, um, you know, a lot of people in Silicon Valley now talk about the pivot and like you, 
you change a button color and like that's a pivot. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a pivot. And I think like what Lee is describing is a pivot, right? <laughs> yeah. um, this was, this was like, like five or six years in. Yeah, it's yeah. like blood, sweat, and yeah. tears, and literal tears. Um, literal blood too. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. It's just like, it's messy. And usually it's not, it's a controversial decision, especially internally, because let's, let's be honest, like to be a founder, you really believe in that vision. You're making something literally out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't believe it, you wouldn't have built it. And now you're being asked by the market, by the customers, um, by your intuition to sort of flip things around. And you have maybe one piece of grounding. So Leah had London as her grounding. She's saying, I know this is gonna work. Uh, but the whole time people are saying, but all this code that you wrote, remember all those sleepless nights? Remember those birthday parties you didn't go to or those social events you gave up on because you were working on this code base? Um, and you're throwing that away. You're throwing away something that you know. And your employees are up in arms around it. And, and so to witness that from a, an investor perspective or, or board member perspective, that's just really, it's hard because you're not sure that you're gonna come out on the other side okay. But um, it was also a decision that you could see needed to be made and what I loved about both what Leah and Stacy would show is they would show the cohort analysis. You guys would show every time, look at this new crew of customers. Yeah. They're sticking with us a lot longer. It is a better set of customers. And from that experience, I really learned this concept, and I've been talking about it with a lot of our other entrepreneurs, this concept of the most valuable customer and what Leah was showing was she was accumulating more valuable customers over time, and that's what gave me confidence. And you can fire your bad customers. And in many ways, there was an accumulation of bad customers, and how courageous is it to actually fire some of your customers midway through building your company? I, I was really, you know, inspired by the courage of that, I think not everyone does it. Not everyone makes that hard decision. Um, but she was very careful to justify it. And she and Stacy were very diligent about showing it on a, on a very consistent basis. Love that concept, firing your customers. Um, let's, we are happy to see the incredible impact TaskRabbit grew across, you know, so many markets acquired by IKEA and then you made the jump to become a venture capitalist yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you could share with us, who was the first person you made your bet on and why? So one of my first bets actually is uh, our two female founders out of New York City building a flexible job marketplace. So right up my alley, future of work, marketplaces, really incredible female founders. Um, and their story and their vision really resonated with me from the beginning and that was the first bet I made. Great, thank you. And Anne, now you're 10 years in, you're a seasoned, what did you call yourself, old cat? Old hag, old, hag. Oh, yeah, she said works. hag. <laughs> old hag. Uh, can you share, when you're looking at entrepreneurs who are pitching to you, whether it's at the creamery or somewhere else, what are you really looking at? What's your mental model that you're looking at to evaluate who you're gonna invest in now? We, we have this, this idea we call the prime mover uh, these days, which, which I've been, really thinking a lot about. Um, the prime mover to us is not just someone who's really agile. And you know, that I think the lean startup movement was really big when I was just getting started. Eric Reese was starting to blog. Steve Blank is someone I've taught with. And so um, I was really into experimentation. And I felt like over the last few years, experimentation's been taken way to the extreme. And I see students, like they don't even know what they're doing. They're just trying to experiment their way to a great outcome. And it just doesn't happen that way, right? You have to actually have an intuition for where things go. And so um, I'm looking for founders who marry that concept of real strategic rigor, which is what we used to have to have 
when um, you, it took you two years to build a product with lots of software and hardware and, and technical risk, um, you knew that there was a customer on the other side because you'd studied it. Um, so I love that kind of strategic rigor where you've taken the time to think about this market, is this the market that matters? Um, how big is it? Is it audacious enough? Do I have these BHAGs for this market? And then finding the entrepreneur who can actually experiment and be agile within that environment. Um, and that's what we call a prime mover. Um, and we're, we're excited to, to try to find those. Was there a time when you had a disagreement? There's this sort of metaphor of friction that can either create fire, going with our metaphor tonight in a very positive way, or it can also just create this kind of crash and burn. Can you talk about what that dynamic is like when there is a difference of, of opinion in a real, like, solid way? And then what did you do to make that a positive or productive uh, outcome? I can't actually remember ever having, like, an all-out fight with Leah or like a real strong disagreement. I think for us, like we've, um, Leah's a truth seeker, right? And I'm a truth seeker. And so we have mutual respect for the truth. And what that means is as long as she's seeking truth and I'm seeking truth, we can have an honest discussion about things. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like a disagreement. It's a debate, right? right? Is this the right metric to be looking at? You know, is this the way the product should work? What does the flow have to look like? Why does it look like that? Um, and if I'm asking questions, it's not from the perspective of, Leah, you're wrong, but rather, I just want to understand it. And Leah is also in the same position of, I want to understand this too. Mm -hmm. And so to me, functional relationships are about that. It's about curiosity and respect for one another's curiosity as mm -hmm. well. So I think when you invested, I remember you saying, like, if we're not disagreeing and debating, like. Yeah. Then, like, why are we both here, right? right. We, we have to make this company better, and we can make each other better, right? And so we absolutely share that philosophy. I mean, one of the great company debates over the years for TaskRabbit is we started so broad. Like, you could get anything done on right. TaskRabbit. Remember those debates? Yeah. And then the debate was, like, should it be one vertical? Should it be one category? Should we just do one thing? You know, the iPhone is the remote control for your life. Should you just be able to say, like, get me a handyman, get my dry cleaning done? Yeah. Why would you go to a platform to do everything? And so those were strategic, you know, debates that happened all the time at the boardroom, but were really, really helpful to the company. And, you know, where we netted out is we ended up honing in on a category around home services and then really developing the messaging and the uh, user experience around that category. So it wasn't a single category and it wasn't everything, but it certainly helped, I think, get the right customers, get the new customers, get the new cohorts right. And those, I think, were the types of conversations that were really helpful. Great. We're going to now join. Uh add in questions from our audience. And the first one actually is for both of you about uh, the number of women VC partners uh, and founders. Um, what's the state of it now and what are you doing, um, if anything, about it? And this is a perfect opportunity if you want to talk about um, All Rise and then um, yeah. shine together. So uh, there's, a, there's a group of about 35 female uh, venture capitalists that were getting together for breakfast on a regular basis. And at one point, um, the founder of Cowboy Ventures, Aileen Lee, sent out a note, I think last July, um, just as all of this sort of stuff was happening with binary capital and Uber, and it felt like there were consequences suddenly, like an entire venture capital firm got shut down uh, because of sexual harassment. and. Um, and so, so Aileen was saying, should we mobilize? Should we do something to, to create change, like real positive change in the environment, and not just complain about it? There were a few dinners, and all of a sudden, a few initiatives. So there was, the first initiative was the female founder office hours, um, where now literally like hundreds of female founders are getting mentored by female venture capitalists. We also have uh, female founders also mentoring other female founders. And they're getting coaching on not only 
um, seed round of financing, but all the way through growth round of financing. We also have an initiative called Founders for Change, where now over 800 founders have voiced the fact that they are um, they're committed to diversity and inclusion, not only internally within their business, but in their boardroom, and that when given the choice, they will seek venture investors who have diverse partnerships. And this includes very well-known founders. Um, and, and what I'm particularly proud of is because there's over 800 such founders. I think we can get to 1,000 um, pretty soon. And I think with that, you know, now we can appeal to the capitalist sensibilities, the, the greed of the venture capital firms, and, and create some sense that if you don't actually start to create diversity, not only is it just bad for business, because you shouldn't be sitting around a partnership saying, yeah, that, that, that business where it's, you know, the consumers, you know, 50% of the population, a bunch of women, um, I'm gonna go ask my wife what she thinks about this business, even though my wife is not part of the partnership. Um, you need to have that firsthand experience. You need to have more perspectives around the table. Um, and that works for people of color as well. And I think just having lots of different diverse viewpoints is becoming increasingly important. And the founders are demanding it. And if you believe that we are gonna see founders coming from all corners of the earth, which just has to be true, right? Then you have to have a partnership that's starting to represent that. And so I'm excited about the change that we're seeing. Just this week, there were something like four female general partners that were announced for many firms. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the start. Like we actually know of many more that have not been announced who have already been hired. Um, we believe that there's a lot more who are in the interview process. Um, we're doing dinners to actually help these women get through that interview process and have an added advantage. But you're seeing women band together in a real incredible sisterhood to, to make it a possibility. And I, I think you know, this cycle that you see with Leah of, I was just sort of a young venture capitalist, some guy actually took a chance on me so we would have 50-50 gender neutral partnership. Um, and then I found a female founder that I could invest in. And you know, a number of years later, she's now investing in the next generation of, of founders. And that's what creates that cycle. And I think uh, we're just seeing the start of it. I'm really excited. Leah, you also are, you have your own initiative. Tell us about your view on, on this and what you're doing to impact change. Yeah, so, you know, I think at that moment last summer where everything sort of came to a head, there were a lot of different, um, different initiatives that fell out of it. And one of the areas that I became really passionate about and excited about, along with Jamie Vigiano here, my co-founder, was just being able to amplify and support the stories of everyday women doing incredible things. And... For us, you know, I think building a crowdsourced marketplace with 50, 60,000 taskers across the US and in London, we had this, this global view on the world. And that it was, we wanted to be able to create a platform that told the stories beyond tech and look for everyday women doing incredible things in all corners of the earth and really give them a way to amplify their voices. So, we were deeply inspired specifically by the work of a senior advisor to President Obama named Valerie Jarrett. And Jamie and I had read this story online about how in President Obama's administration that Valerie and the senior members of the cabinet who were women had made this pact with each other that they would go into meetings if they felt like one of their ideas was being talked over or overpowered by some of the other people in the room that they would help amplify. They would give credit to the idea, amplify the idea, and around and around and around until it was so obvious <laughs> that that idea was that person's idea and that they should talk about it, um, that it would happen. And so th this concept was called shine theory. Jamie and I were talking, we were brainstorming, we were thinking it wouldn't be great if we could amplify voices 
for women everywhere. How can we take this concept of shine theory and really make it into a technology platform that scales? This is what we do, right? We hustled our way into getting Valerie on the phone and Jamie and I kind of pitched her this concept, got her feedback. She immediately on the spot said, I wanna do everything I can to help. And so we have her story posted on shinetogether.us. We have the Olympic gymnast, Nastia Lukin as well. We have Anne's story on the site to other entrepreneurs. And so it's really just meant to be a platform that celebrates and amplifies the voices of women everywhere. Well, from your beginnings in Shirley, Massachusetts, and Palo Alto, California, thank you for telling us your story of what's brought you to your connection and building TaskRabbit and this 10-year relationship now that's now paying it forward and impacting not only great funders and other founders, but also women and others. So it's been a <laughs> pleasure to have you here at the Computer City Museum. Thank you. This show is part of At the Forefront, dedicated to celebrating women in technology and inspiring the next generation of female innovators and leaders. Join us next time for CHM Revolutionaries.